Hi, and welcome to the Penny Lane Podcast. Uh, this week's guest is Callum from MTA. You know, Callum, usually Justin and I interview the person and then we go back and do an intro based on what we thought of the interview or whatever. But, you know, we're pretty close with you. Like I talk, just full disclosure, talk to you pretty much every day and you talk to Justin a lot. So if you don't mind, we might just circle you in for this intro. Is that cool? Yeah, more than fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it's a weird episode today because I've had a string of, uh, uh, I've had a series of unfortunate events for those of you who are Lemony Snicket's fans. Um, <laughs> most recently, some type of transformer blew up at my house. So I'm at my office with, uh, wet hair, no makeup and 30 minutes late. I don't think I've ever been late to a podcast, but I am today. So we're just, we're going to roll with it. That's what's new with me, Justine. What's new with you? You know, I, I face value. You, you appear very calm, centered, collected. I don't, I don't, I don't get the feeling that things are just really not going your way. Yeah, no, I'm losing my shit underneath, <laughs> but you gotta, you gotta bury that, you know, Callum's here. I, we do need to ask Callum how things are going on that side of the pond. I've been waiting to say Oh, that. oh, oh, Callum, one of the questions is someone wants you to do your best American accent, and it might be time. Maybe that's your warm-up. Hey, y'all, how you doing? <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Oh, that'll bring a chuckle. Um, Justin, there's a story that Kate knows really well. There, when we were in Switzerland – skiing with the family uh that very famous story of those english guys that i was kind of hitting on i had quite a few beers and then decided i was only talking in an english accent the whole night and they were like he mm-hmm. does pretty good <laughs> i'm sure they're like please stop please this stop. is your embarrassment we have secondhand embarrassment <laughs> i was really trying to woo them with my english accent though you know Mm. Mm. Only English accents can woo American speaking people. I don't think it works the other way. Callum, if you're ever hanging out with someone American, do you find yourself just sort of falling into your American accent impression? Um, I, I prefer the English accent there, uh, you know, to the American. I, I'm not very keen on the American accent. <laughs> that's that's really quite a dig not even a like slight dig just a your accent sucks dig i appreciate that i find it cool though you know the country accent it's always you know nice to hear different different twangs you know especially uh brad and stevens quite a bit as well okay are you talking about us though Mm. right I, (laughs) (laughs) like i say it's to me, an American accent can be pretty mundane, um, mm-hmm. but, but you know, I I think you guys have an interesting accent. I do find it interesting, you know, to hear all the different types, and that's one of the good thing about being part of a Discord predominantly American. I have to hear it all the time, but yeah, I, I do like the American accent. I guess I'm just used to it. We have a lot of different accents across the country. I'd be curious to know, like, I, I could think of like ten. Okay, let's the, hear them. In, Name ten. No, I, um, well, just in the Northeast, you have about four. All right. New York to Boston is very different. Th- that's and two. Then, okay, and then you've got like the Minnesota area. It's like soda pop. So like that's what very they say, good, right? very good. Three. Yep. And then you can go all the way to Pacific Northwest if, if you want to go that side of the country, and they definitely have a very like an Oregon. Northern California accent. You know, I'm the, having trouble okay. hearing that in my Zero. head. Fine. Let's okay, go down. Okay, so, Southern California. Okay. With like the Beverly Hills Valley Girl accent. That's a thing. <laughs> Tell me that one, just so I have it clear in my head. Because you'd have to call my you have to call my mother. She it's she has it. All right. Well, I'll um, I'll give you Valley Girl. Like so we're at four. Girl? You okay. said you can okay. name ten. Keep going. Okay, okay. Texas. Okay. Done. Great. Five. A Texas draw is very different than uh, like a, a Louisiana, Alabama draw. 
Oh, that's very good. Different. Very good. That's very different. Is, and then, and then, well, within Texas, there are several because Matthew McConaughey, I think, is the most iconic mm-hmm. Texas. Mm-hmm. But apparently, yep. there's other Texas accents. Who knew? Yeah. And then we, I've skipped over part of the country. We'll come back to it if I need it. Okay. But I do think that there's a Mid Atlantic kind of accent, like the Baltimore area, that um, has got a lot of. Uh, uh, what, what's that football announcer who used to do Joe Flacco? There's a there's a big okay. There's someone out there who knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's a Baltimore kind of mid mid Atlantic accent. All right, that's a thing. We're Don't worry about that. And then also, okay, the the Florida country accent is Nine. very different. Nine. Yeah. Yeah. And now if you I can now I can go anywhere in the country. I can go to Maine or I can go to like Boys. Nebraska yeah. or Nebraska or upstate Buffalo, which is Canadian, eh? I mean, I could do I can't do the accents very well, but there's a lot. Justin, have you considered midnighting in uh <laughs> comedy or just maybe local calls, one eight hundred no. numbers? <laughs> You just got to get your uh, buffalo fix in for the night. And yeah, you call me up. Just so, but my question was for Callum was like, okay, all of those are very different accents to me. I'm assuming the UK, you could probably come up with like 15 of them pretty quick, right? Mm, y- yes, but I'm not going to imitate any of them. <laughs> you <laughs> I'm sure? Not clap myself on. Yes, I. I'm very sure of that. So why don't you start by telling us your uh, how you got into trading? Okay, so it all started when I was 19, first of all. I was working in a supermarket, and first of all, I just wanted some extra money. So I was that typical guy that would go onto YouTube, you know, how to make money. And I came across, you know, long-term investing, such as stocks like Apple, Amazon, just a typical long-term stock. So... I had an account for a while, like just as an experiment while working in the supermarket. But then once I got my proper job as an engineer, I started to want to save more. And I had an instant savings account. And obviously these saving accounts were meant to be beneficial because you made you made a lot of money per interest per year on it. But due to COVID with the economy, the interest rates kept coming down, down, down to the point where I thought, what am I doing with my money? I need to, you know, I need to put my money elsewhere. So for me, then I went on to YouTube myself again, done the same search and I came across small caps trading. And I'd done that by searching about how to make money fast. And I know that's not the best way to start it, but I'm going to be honest. So when I seen small caps trading, it looked like there was a lot of money to be made in it. And I watched a certain YouTuber and he showed him going through and he was making thousands per day. Obviously, that's the dream to make thousands per day, but it was nice to get an insight. But that's what first kicked off my insight into trading was actually going onto YouTube and just typing in how to make money. <laughs> I love that honesty. And God knows we've all been there, right? That's a very human story that uh, I really love. And you did that on Friday, right, Blaine? <laughs> Every morning, <laughs> fire up the Google, how to make money. <laughs> she's like, I'm going to watch TD tutorials, but actually she's typing that in. <laughs> uh, my, my TD education is going great. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so before you keep going, Blaine, I want to ask Calum a question. I, I'm assuming he probably gets this a lot. So I don't want to disclose his age or anything. He mentioned that he was working – uh, around 19 when you started to check out trading. Uh, like the way that you speak and the sound of your voice and and the way that you talk online, you, you come across as so much older and mature and uh, I just like got a good grounded head together versus, I, to be honest, as young as you, you really are, which is an amazing thing. I imagine that really helps with trading. It's not a question. I just wanted to point it out as a compliment. Oh, maybe if we wanted to go back to my astrology, which I know we all enjoy hearing about, maybe we could just say that Calm's a really old soul. He seems like an old soul. What do you guys think? Are you an old soul when you get to the pub, Calm? <laughs> I'm beyond an old soul when I get to the pub. <laughs> 
<laughs> Why is that? Because you don't go? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm already, I'm already, um, I'm already gone by the time I get to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Double in America. God, why is this so loud? In America, Callum, people in, um, it's a very common thing to, when you're in college and you're in a fraternity or, or a sorority, you would get, you didn't have any money. No one has any money. So you just get as drunk as possible at your frat or, you. oh, I was only at frats because I like boys. Um, so I, you just get as drunk as possible <laughs> at the frat. And then by the time you get to the bar, you only have to have like one drink. Yeah. And I, I, on a, on a sense, we do that here, even when I didn't go to university personally, but when I ever went up to uni towns, obviously we'd go to the uni dorms, you know, everyone stays and just go for the pre-drinks there and get absolutely bladderated. And then obviously you only have to buy a few drinks and when you're out and you can have a really good night. So yeah, we do the same concept here, just not as cool with the whole, you know, fraternity scene, like it's pictured over there in the US. Yeah, it seems, seems yeah, pretty cool fun. though. I have a, a dream. I'm, this is going to sound weird because I'm old now, but I would like before I die to get drunk in one of these uni towns that he's talking about. I don't really know what that means, but it just sounds better than what we have. Yeah, mm. all these people in the Discord who are uh, in uni and keep talking about uni, I'm like, sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Ah, we can move on back to trading. I'm sorry. That was my fault. All right. So, all right. So you get started trading and then you Google how to get rich, which we've established we all do. And then you find small caps. And then what do you make your way onto Twitter? Yes. As you know, Twitter is the thriving place of small cap trading. So when I first made my way to the scene on Twitter, obviously found certain accounts that had a lot of influence and I seen they were all, you know, part of one or two discords. So I joined one of them discords first of all. That was my, you know, first birthplace joining one of them, which a lot of us do. We all join, you know, the popular discord. So that was my first step, you know, to really put in my foot into the water. Okay. And moment of truth, did you uh, slap any alerts? In that Discord, or you've, you've always been as mature as you are now? <laughs> no, you know, it's one of them where I think it's like a christening of hell sometimes going into them because you learn a lot. You learn a lot when you first go in there, you know. And I think a lot of people have done the same route, you know, where you go there, you think you slap one call and you think it's magical when you get the gains. And then obviously you work out what the deal is after a while and uh, you can take a step back and think, Oh God, what was I doing? But you know, I think everyone's, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people have been through that same process as me where you see someone putting a cool idea, you know, in a floor and you go, Oh, I like that, you know, and you just, you slap it. And that's what I did do, you know, when I first started. Real quick. So when you were Googling how to get rich or, or how to make money, or was it when you got onto Twitter, did you make the decision that I'm going to trade the American markets? Was that a conscious decision or did you have to figure that out on your own? And did you start trading other international markets, whether it was European or Asia, uh, or was it always, I just, I need the volume. I knew day one that they, that, that I was going to be an American market trader. Okay. So, uh, very good question. Uh, so there was part of my time where I was on YouTube and it was during the COVID time where I could trade, you know, stocks from the UK because they did have a little bit of volatility from the COVID crisis, you know, where you could buy, you know, the bottoms, obviously, of, of the company and you could try, you know, just hold it, hold it, hold it till it risen up. But then after that, I just thought these stocks ain't cutting it for me. And majority of the time when I was searching small cap trade, and obviously it was or US. So I kind of was just, you know, always into that basket of trading US stocks. I, I never really had the interest of trading something that didn't move, you know. When was it that you decided I can't just buy, take calls anymore? I've got to learn how to do this myself. And then how did you go about learning to do that? got to a point where you do something so many times you go I'm not going to make that mistake again and it was after 
there was a honeymoon period i think we all know you know during that christmas time you know last year up in, in december it was and then obviously january this year you know there was it was quite a lucrative market just to be able to slap a call and then obviously you get taught a lesson when the market turns and then i realized you know i need to hone in and you know actually actually create a strategy you know because these guys have obviously got a strategy but i don't and that needs to change because i realized you know these guys must have a plan i don't i'm just mindlessly buying a call so th- i think the market taught me a lesson in that once the market you know calmed down in the sense you know blaine when uh, you, you know i think sndl was like the last last you know squeeze move and then it really you know started petering off from there so i i then realized that i needed to step up my game and you know look to actually nail down trading and learn it fully when you first started trading how how did you manage the time difference and then did that take you a long time to figure out when you can put in the study time versus the actual trading hours uh because you are five to six hours ahead of the u.s market right or was that uh something right away that you just said this is all the time that i have to throw at this i'm going to make these windows every day and that's how it's been ever since right so the perks of having a network engineering job like i do i i i work remotely from my house and i and i work where i go out to site you know from my home so i'm not required to be in an office so if i'm working 8 a.m till 4 p.m which is my normal contract shift. The time zone over here, the market starts at 2.30 p.m. and ends at 9 p.m. So I don't really miss too much of the market. And normally, most of the time, I try to get all my jobs done in hand, you know, in the morning so I can get home in time for open. So for me, the time zone factor wasn't too bad because it's just one of them you've just got to put up and accept it. So I don't want to out you here, Callum, but are you a mobile trader like Blaine? No. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, not only no, but said with disdain for those of us who might be mobile I, traders. I do, I do have, I do have the Weeble app. You know, I do, I do have my trading apps on my phone, but predominantly that will just be to monitor the market. I don't like taking heavy positions while I'm out because that for me is a risk. You know, I'd rather be at my desk. Noted, right, Blaine? Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you're out there, you're looking for a new path, and then you found MTA. Yep, is that the next step on your journey? Yes, yeah, exactly, sir. So I never actually spotted Brad in in the Discord I was in originally. I actually, I, I can't remember how I spotted Brad, but Blaine, you know how it is on Twitter. You just come across, you know, pages, and one day I came across Mullins Momentum, and I seen he was starting a Discord, and funny enough, I think I joined on the second day, so I'm not quite as good as you, Blaine. Oh, I, I'm not. A fir- se- I'm not a first day or an MTA, You're but second yeah. day or well, we're gonna have to <laughs> kick you out of the OG room. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's on that's on how I found it, just out of randomness. But you know, on how thin twit Twitter works, you know, you just come across you know pages and people. So I'm so grateful, you know, that I found that page at the time and I joined, and obviously I'm here now. Do you believe in fate, Callum? Yes. Do you think it was fate that you found MTA? Wow, it was either fate or goddamn good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, Aww. I'm happy to be here. Ooh, that was deep. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, mean, I, I think there's a rabbit hole that you can fall down, you know, if you don't go to the right places. And I think from me falling into the hands of coming into MTA and learning from the right people, it sped up my process quite a lot quicker than what it would if I was just if I was just stagnating, you know, still taking someone's course. Well, you really you joined MTA and rose to the rose to the top fairly quickly. Apparently, you're the you're the number three guy there now. So that I mean, it's a huge honor, huge responsibility. Um, what does that responsibility mean to you? It means a lot and I'm extremely I'm extremely honored to even be given the consideration of that role. And the 
two main people I have to thank a lot are the top two in charge there being Warris and Brad, who you two have obviously spoke to before on previous podcasts. They're both great and they have helped me tremendously so far. There's been so many aspects of my trading career that they've helped me with mentally and trading wise. And I, I think it's so good to have such a good support bubble and especially to them too. They've definitely shown me that there's a lot more to be done you know there's a lot more that i can do that i didn't realize in the trading world and um i'm extremely honored to have that role in the discord well we got we got a lot of uh listener questions and so many of the questions are so incredibly complimentary of you which is wonderful but then also people are so grateful for your time and your a uh, willingness to teach other people and pay it forward. What do you get out of helping other people succeed? It may sound cheesy, but it's that satisfaction of succeeding together. You know, I, I think Discord is meant for, you know, the communication, the connecting together. And from it sounds weird, but for me being from England to help people in America, you know, I think that's amazing over the headset just to be able to do that and to be able to communicate to people I never thought I ever would. So I I really do think it's an honor to be able to just help anyone succeed because it's always that feeling of when you help someone else, you know, that actually puts a greater smile on my face than myself succeeding when you've actually helped someone else achieve something. So for me, it it, it really is a great honor to have people, you know, so complimentary. And I wouldn't be able to do it without any of the MTA family over there. You know, <clears throat> that's really big of you to say, because if you've ever seen the theatrical performance, Hamilton, we left you during the Revolutionary War. <laughs> you don't owe us anything. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being serious. So uh, I, that's one thing in all seriousness that Blaine says all the time. She's like, I just want to make some money with my friends, which is there's a lot of camaraderie with that. And I think that's – I mean it, it may sound cheesy or novel, but uh, there's definitely truth – to that. It's also kind of the same thing as like if you had a, a, a nine to five job in an office with a team around you. And if you don't enjoy doing what you do with those people and making money with them, then you go somewhere else and do it. So you guys are, are talking about, it's just kind of just, it, it makes sense to, to me. So that's all I have to say about that. Callum, have you ever thought about quitting or not trading anymore? No, never. Do you because, feel? Because it's, when, when, sorry to interrupt, but when, no, no, no. when I've been, especially since I've joined MTA, you know, there's no looking back because you have all the support you need in a discord like this, where I can lean on to people for help and they can lean on to me. And that's on how the system works of having someone. So I can, if, if I've ever felt that way, I know I can go to someone and speak to them. And to be honest, everyone at MTA, I think, will succeed and can succeed. You know, it's down to all of us to make sure we do it. But the resources are all there. So I, I don't think there's ever an excuse for me to quit trading unless it affects me mentally too much. But for now, I'm enjoying every single minute of it. You know me, Blaine. Every single <laughs> time I can, I'm always at my desk. I'm always watching charts. I'm always in voice. I love it too much. I'd never think about quitting. I don't want to be ambiguous here because success is is not the same to a lot of people. What does success mean to you? Success to me is, first of all and foremost, we're, we're trading. So it would be making an amount of money per day for me in what I'm doing first of all but then also in my role in the discord it is that camaraderie you know of being successful together with people because like you say there's no better feeling you know when when you all bag a winner together and that's what true success I think is you know when you're all winning like the whole team's winning and uh for me yeah success primarily obviously is for me to be profitable which I am and I'm very grateful that I am and now the success is to obviously help us has become profitable and for me on my journey to excel and go further and further and further in my journey because I'm right at the start of my journey still you know and I'm just happy on where I'm at with my time being like I say if 
it was just so nice to stumble into MTA when I did because it basically gave me a path to go down and I think I've tried to utilize it at every point I can. My best friend and I read a book a couple of years ago and I wish I could remember the name of it, but I can't. That, But that book talked about like when you're on your life's path and fulfilling your life's purpose, that doors open and things go a lot easier. And that's kind of, you fall into the flow of it. And that's how you know that you're doing what you're supposed to do. Um, And so if you're trying to be a grocery bagger, like you were before, maybe you hit obstacle after obstacle of like, this isn't exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. But as an outsider's perspective, it seems very much to me like you're in the flow and you know uh, what to do in MTA, what's needed, what's called for. And it seems very much like you have hit the right place, the right time um, in your life. And I'm, I'm jealous of that in some ways because what a, I think that I've been there before And I think that's such a magical time, but that's just my opinion on what's happening to you. Does any of that feel true to you? Yeah, I, I definitely feel like I have, I have this thing right now where I've got tunnel vision for what I want to do and I'm going straight down that tunnel, especially fingers crossed. We get that hot market coming in a few months time, uh, hopefully next month, but I really do have that tunnel vision just to keep on going and just you know, not stopping right now, because I feel like I need to make my, I need to make it count now so I can carry on excelling. You know, there's no point in stopping, you know, even in this bad market, Blaine, you know, yourself, I've always tried to breathe positivity about on how, if we're learning our risk management now, when the hot market comes, we're going to kill it. You know, if we're using a good risk management now, you know, everyone's going to be killing it in the hot market. So I've got that vision where I just want to keep on going at my age, which I will reveal I'm 21. So I just want to keep on going because I, for me, you guys think that I'm young, but for me, there's so many people in the trading world that are actually way younger than me. So mm-hmm. I'm actually jealous of their position. So it's, you know, that thought of different people's minds, because for me being a 21 year old, I wish I could have started at 18, you know? So yeah, it's interesting to hear different perspectives, but yeah, I just want to keep on hitting it head first. Well, as someone who is older than you and is having the privilege of watching you on this journey, it feels very much like we're watching like a Michael Jordan and his, you know, UNC days before he gets to the NBA, before he's the greatest of all time. Like, I really can't wait to watch you uh, flourish. That was also a lot of basketball terminology that I was a little shaky on. How'd I do? <laughs> well, you did good. I don't mean to be shallow, but I was going to ask Callum if that resonates at all. Yeah, I, but everyone knows Michael Jordan to some extent, right? Yeah, no, that, that totally is a very, very, very big compliment that – Obviously, I appreciate very much and obviously I hope one day that I can get to the point, you know, where I am earning enough to obviously step down as an engineer and carry on trading full time. And like I say, I want to excel from post to post to post, but my life goal is, you know, to be comfortable, you know, and to to get out of that nine to five. You You talked about the market right now and hopefully a hot market upcoming. Can we talk? Some technical things, Blaine, Callum? Sure, what do you think? sure. So one, you talked about risk management now, and you mentioned to me uh, about resizing your trades in certain markets. Can you talk about the thought process behind? That's one thing. There's one there's a lot of different types of risk management, right? It's like scaling in, scaling out, setting stop losses knowing your your exit points, but then there's a different risk management, which is not only the size of your trades, but I think something that you've done recently. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So like I was speaking to you about before, and Blaine knows this as well, during the bad market, I see no reason to have a full account value. So what I've done with my account is I took... I think half of my trading account out, put it back into the bank and said, 
I'm going to be patient because I know there'll be an opportunity where if I need the money, I can put it back in. But if I started with £10 before and made it to 100 you know, I can do it again. And it's the time where we are in this market where not everything's going to go our way. I have no problem. You know, I, I don't need to rush. I can just put an account with £2,000 in and I can just trade with that. I have no problem with doing that. As long as I'm hitting my percentage gain that I want, I have no problem because I don't pay attention to the money because something War has taught me bigly, uh, very big, was about base hits. You know, if, if you're base hitting, you are going to succeed. You know, it's not about the home runs. Okay. You know, so if I'm trading with two grand or 20 grand, you know, I'm focusing on that percentage. And that's what I've done. So I've downsized very heavy to where I'm trading with one grand, two grand account balances. And I'm just going from there, just literally doing the same thing every day. It doesn't affect how I trade. It doesn't affect what I do, but it reduces my risk quite a bit by not having my full account there. And when that market does come back, I can either put the money back in or hopefully by that time I would have compounded the same amount. I, I think that's amazing. Blaine, is that, is, have you done that at all? It, at least, I mean, whether it's right now in a bit of a cooler market or in the past? Justin, you know I'm fiscally irresponsible. I haven't done Got it. anything like that, obviously. I, 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 I will say I do have a benefit of living in the UK where I don't have PDT. So I don't need Ooh, to. That's I don't. A fun fact. So I don't need to have twenty five grand in my account. So I can literally put a tenner in <laughs> and trade the U.S. market, which is very weird that I can trade the market mm-hmm. easier than you guys in your own country. But yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's probably a whole conversation we can have about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, stack deck. Uh, <laughs> Justin, we got a lot of uh, questions for Callum. And I, I didn't put them in any type of order, but I'd love if we could start going through some of those. Well, you know, we, we're talking about some technical things, and I've got a couple right here. If we could just keep going with technical, because Callum was just talking about, what, well, and you had originally asked about slapping the ask. So for beginners, do you recommend scaling in by using market orders uh, I, or, sla- or slapping the ass? I recommend using or limit, limit orders. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I recommend using limit orders. And that comes down to a thesis of, I won't lie, I do use, I do slap the ask on breaks, but that's myself because I'm a bit further in my journey. But if I, if I was speaking to anyone that's just starting, I would say trade within your pattern or your shape that's on how i'd always do it so if i've got an ascending an ascending triangle i would i would add on my bottom trend line with a with a limit buy because you know what your value is going to be and you can wait there and i would also use your stop a stop limit there i would i would never market market buy as a beginner because i would always say to trade within your parameters and take things slow there's no rush you know, so when you're first beginning, you want to get that basic understanding of trading the pattern rather than, you know, slapping a break. <laughs> because I, because I, break, I slaps, think... break slaps are good, but they're way better in a hot market, first of all, and you need a bit of experience. You know, if you set those limits too, you're, you are teaching yourself diligence because you, it, you could keep raising the limit, which is the same thing as if you just were – so slab in the ass, but that I mean, if you if you have your plan and you you have your number there, or you keep you know lowering uh, well, your here's sale, the, here's, or here's the it may thing. Be, but here's the thing: if you if you do just a slap the ask, or you do the market buy without the limit, you're you're at risk of slippage. So if I press buy, that price can slip down, even you know from when I've pressed buy. But when you've got that limit, you've got your number in your head. You've got your you've got your risk management in place because you know where you're entering. And that that can affect you, especially on liquid tickers, that small caps, you know? That's what small mm-hmm. caps are, volatility. Yeah. You could lose out on five, six, seven, eight cents uh, pretty pretty quickly there. That's as big. Those things are, yep. No, absolutely. So let's see. Moving on, 
Can you talk about your strategy for finding the low volume movers of the day that have a potential to turn into big gainers? Uh, so tell us, is this one of your larger strategies currently or all of the time? And then if you could talk about that strategy. Yeah. So as we've talked about before, we're not in the best market. You know, we're not in a chasers market as such permanently right now. So I, you'll always want to be in before the move happens. So the way I look at these low low volume movers is I've got a bit of a tick list myself. So I look for confluences. So my first my first check will have to be a steady stream of volume. So if I'm looking down the gainer list, let's say at number eight ticker, it can have 1K volume, it can have 10K volume, it can have 100K volume sticks. But as long as they're relative, that's fine, you know? So they're relative. And yeah, it can have a few anomalies because there'll be people playing like me that might add a bit more on the candle. The second the second most important thing actually is solid news. You know, if I'm looking down the gainers list, you still need to fundamentally have a reason for why you're playing that ticker, whether it be a Q2 earnings or, you know, it's a bio with a phase two data. You need to still have a news reason or a price target as such. You can't just... You can't just look at the ticker and go, oh, this doesn't have anything. I'm going to play it because then your risk is so far out because you don't know what you're playing. So I like that to have a solid solid base for why it's up. And then my third, reason, uh, my third tick list would be the RSI being bottom and oversold. And this is a bonus for me. This is my little special where I go around at lunchtime and I'll go on the gainers list and just scroll through all of them and go on the five minute and I'll see if it's in the oversold range below 30 on the RSI. And if it is, and it's got both of the criteria above, I will I will take a position most of the time, uh, which I demonstrate live in MTA quite a bit of the time, where I will take that position as when it's oversold, your risk is way less than when it's overbought at the top. So, who's, who's lunchtime? The US market? Or your lunch time? <laughs> no, your uh, Eastern time, sir. I'm working Got on it. your time. No. <laughs> Got it. No, oh, hey, I pre- I appreciate that. I just was making sure. <laughs> Got it. So you, so the, so the, the boring lunch hour is when you may look at that last option and yeah. pick up some some afternoon, some some afternoon. Yeah. So plays. so yeah. So like, let's take for example a buyer play it has phase phase three data and phase three data is really good. So we we see the pop in the morning and we see it might come down. And when we see it at Eastern time, lunchtime, uh, when we see that in the in the oversold range in 30, we look at the volume there and we can see that it had a lot of volume in the beginning of the day in pre-market. So we know the volume's there and we can tell that it's just lunchtime. So what I'd do there is I would take I would take on the news. And I would, and I'd play it all the way up until I feel, until I feel that the move's done. And I do that with the EMAs, and I also play the RSI confluence. So if the RSI is moving up with me in a bullish way, I'll keep playing that RSI. And it's a good thing to learn. It's called RSI divergence, and you can learn that in MTA. Look at that advertisement right there. <laughs> so. Speaking of some of these, so it doesn't really matter the indicator, but let's talk about confirmation versus anticipation. And confirmation, obviously, a lot of times we talk about it based on candlestick movements or patterns. It could be exactly what you just talked about on on our side, divergence. It doesn't really matter, but can you talk about confirmation versus anticipation and, and waiting on confirmation and whether or not that means that the move may or may not have already happened, that the market's already there, or with anticipation, uh, if that's risky, too risky, or if you're able to balance the risk versus reward. I am a very big believer in confirmation, and I'll tell you why now. So let's say, for an example, we have a diagonal trend line going downwards. You want the stock to break that diagonal trend line. And anticipating the break of that trend line is just guessing where it's going to come through. If you've got that diagonal line and it's not touching yet and you buy in, who's to say that it breaks through? You would just be anticipating, which to me is basically guessing. What you want to see is that confirmation of it breaking through the trend line with volume. And that is where you confirm, because if you're anticipating a trend line break, you can just be riding that the whole way down and it may never break that line. With confirmation, it goes through the line with volume. So you can confirm 
that there is buyers there in the tape, you can confirm that it's broke your trend line, and then you can play the move up from there. And it's way it's a way better system because you're waiting for that confirmation. Anticipating for me is a guessing game. I always have to wait for that volume sign and the trend line break because if you don't wait for that, what are you actually playing? You're just playing your you're playing your sanity that it's going to break that line. You know, you'd rather wait for that break because we've had that quite a few times during this market, Justin, where you think it's going to break it and it just keeps coming down and down and down. And then eventually, you know, you, you bummed out the move because you tried to anticipate it. You'd rather wait and maybe lose out a couple cent and wait for the positive break. And then if it is a strong enough positive break with confirmation, you'll make your money. Mm -hmm. So what are you learning right now? And are you learning something in anticipation of a new strategy or what you think the market may be coming? I, I know you're learning something new every day. Don't tell me you're just a student of the market. What are you like specifically working on and learning right now? I am right now, I am still honing in on that strategy of finding the lower gainers because I was okay. one that was moved by noise before. And going back to the lower gainer tactic, people will. People think it's fashionable just to play the first three gainers because it's the most talked about. You know, it's lies. You can play any of the gainers, you know, when you go down. And that's one thing that a lot of people struggle with, including myself, while well, I did anyway, with the noise. And that was one key thing in my trading, blocking out the noise. Because if I'm seeing news, if I'm seeing volume, if I'm seeing that my levels attain that I want, let's say the oversold and it's in 30, I'm going to take that trade. And the benefit is with that strategy that I'm still trying to master myself is that you don't have to listen to the noise. You just play the volume that's there and you play the chart. So, you know, even if you do take an owl on, on the trade, you know what you've done wrong and there's no outside in fact, is there? Uh, do you... So to, to when you're learning this, whether or not you took a position, how are you charting this stuff out? Are you are you journaling by hand using a platform for that? I know we ask this question a lot, but you are obviously putting in the work to do that. Yes. So I I actually have my own Discord, which is a private Discord that I use as a journal, and I'll give you some benefits of why a Discord journal is great. With the Discord journal, I can put my chart literally straight from where the chart is into the digital footprint of my Discord. Second of all, I can actually go through and analyze it with someone. So let's take, for example, if Waris wants to come review my trades, which I, I always love him to come in and do that. Now we try to do that once a week, and I do that with other mentors as well. They can come into my Discord room, and we can review all the trades I've took because they're all there. Rather than you trying to hand draw the chart, you've got the chart mm -hmm. right there, clear in 4K, and I can talk over why I've done it and how. And, you know, it's all there for me just to keyword search as well on the computer. So I've, I've recently made that change, though. I've done this about two weeks ago, this change, and it's benefited me quite a bit by being able to take a trade, then instantly screen grab it, put it in, the disc, put it in my Discord, explain why. And the third benefit, of the discord is you can have multiple channels so i've actually got my own education channel in my own discord <laughs> so the key things that i need to learn more i have all my material saved in there so if everything was to disappear justin i've got everything that i need you know to learn interesting so it's like you have a, a journal or, or like a microsoft one note or pages but yours is a bit more of a public forum for accountability yeah, because I think the journaling accountability for me ties in well. I I don't I think for me it's important to show why I took a move and how I played it because I can get other people's perspectives. I'm not afraid to take an L on a trade, you know. I will put that trade in there and we can talk about it face to face because it only betters me. If you're, you know, not putting them trades that you take an L on, you're just lying to yourself. So I always get people to peer review my trades and I'll always, you know, be bugging people as it's Broder, Berkey, Warris, Brad. I'll, I'll always, you know, get them to try and analyze all my trades that I've done and ask them for their opinion because I, I just think that format works so good. Like 
I can't get Warris over here to come look at my handwritten journal, can I? So that's another thing of why Discord is great. For sure. <laughs> um, we have we have some notes for you from uh, people in MTA, and we're we're getting a little close to the end of the interview, so I think I might as well go ahead and read some of those. Um, oh, actually, <clears throat> before we do that, Walrus ask a question, which is, how hard is it working a full-time job and learning what it takes to be a professional day trader? And how long before you started to finally see all the hard work paying off? So this is interesting because I am now a full-time engineer, but for for two years, I was an apprentice engineer. So I was learning my network engineering at the same time. So obviously when my apprenticeship and the trading collided, it was almost like a clash of both worlds. But I feel like over time you come with a system to deal with it. And it is sometimes mentally straining, but it's all part of the journey, I think, of of learning. You get you get a safe system on how to work it. So I will do my work. I'll take a break, then come sit at my desk and trade for as long as I need to. But I know when it's time for me, you know, to clock off and go on my Xbox because <laughs> work working working two jobs, I think you do need to have a bit of a break in between. But but then again, like I say, you become used to it. And for me, the trading of it, although it's a chore, I enjoy it every single day. And for for on how long it took before it started to pay off in my mind, I think since joining MTA about two months, it, it took me two months because that's when I finally started realizing, you know, I've elevated my trading game from from what where I was at before. You know, I started to see the results and I thought, damn, you know, you've you've came a bit of a way, <laughs> you know, considering last year I was just slapping course, you know, and then I think I've now got a set set system what I do. I've got precautions in place. I've got my risk management there. So I I think probably about two months in is when I felt like I, I was achieving stuff and it and it was starting to pay off for me. All right. Love it. Um, this is from Gup, our favorite Gup. Who is Callum's favorite wanker and why is it Gup? Which I think is a joke. And the question is, but also, what's it like to be a 21-year-old in an inspiration and teacher for people older than you and in different parts of the world from you? Do you feel any pressure from your platform or does it add to your confidence in yourself? That's such a sweet I, question. <laughs> I feel, it feels, it, you know what, it feels extremely cool to have people asking me questions because it must mean I'm doing something right. I I try to be on voice ever present as much as I can and helping people as like we talked about before. If we're not winning as a team, you know, it doesn't make me the most happy. I, I want all of us to be winning. So for people to feel comfortable coming and asking me questions, that's extremely cool and an honor to have. So I, I enjoy that fully. And feeling pressure from the platform? No, because we're a family at MTA. We know that we're going to have, you know, red days. We know we're going to have green days, but we get through it together. And it does add confidence in myself, especially when I'm screen sharing on voice and going through something. It, I'm still learning myself, like I say. So when I'm going through something, it helps me understand it more. When I'm going through a move on how I played it, I'm always learning my moves still. So now I don't feel any pressure, like I say, and I, it's extremely honorable that people can feel the need to come to me. And I'm extremely honored for that. All right, next one from cute Miki, which is, I guess, how you say it. Uh, Miki says, I don't have any questions, but tell him, Miki says, thank you for all your help over the last few months. You have been one of the greatest teachers I've found. Oh, my God. <laughs> Me <laughs> Miki, man. Yeah. yeah, I love that man. I, I, I love him to bits, you know, and uh, whenever he needs me, I'll always be a Miki, you know. <laughs> And then we have one from Stephen, not Walrus, the other Stephen. Um, Stephen would like to say first that he's very proud of you and considers you a great friend and he loves you. His question is, how does it feel to be a 21-year-old Englishman that holds down an engineering job that you're very successful at, hold a crucial moderator position in the MTA family, and be a rock star trader? Which I do think we've covered, but... I really appreciate him asking that. Cute, Stephen. 
Yeah. Is there anything it's you want to add? <laughs> I, I, I want to add straight back to him that I am bloody well super proud of Stephen. You know, he he he's done so well in the time he's been a player. I think you've seen that yourself. Uh, you know, he's he's literally came and absorbed everything. When you want something, you go get it, and he'll come to my DMs and he'll be asking me, "How do you do this?" And I love that attitude. You know, I challenge anyone if you want something go get it you know we're we're advertised as the team members in there for you to come to us you know and ask if you've got any questions so Stephen, i'm super proud of you mate and uh, i love you <laughs> all right and then this one from booch um <laughs> what is your ideal order from mackie's <laughs> um hold on what's mackie's <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> oh shit! That's not fair. Can we bleep that out? I didn't. I didn't realize that. <laughs> um, yeah, it would. Uh, it's pretty boring, but yeah, it would have to be five chicken selects, large fries, and uh, cheese bites. And obviously, the chicken selects are basically what you guys call chicken tenders over there. <laughs> What's a cheese bite? Oh, it's like uh, you get these like. Well, you can. They they do different seasonal cheese bites. So sometimes they'll do red Leicester cheese melts, like these little, obviously uh, cheese balls, or they'll do like nacho cheese bites. They've done some Dorito ah. cheese bites before McDonald's. It's re- it's really good. So they do it promotionally throughout the year. You know, rotate different ones. But no Royale with cheese. Good lord. <laughs> that uh, perfect follow up is impressive. Emu's question: How's your cholesterol considering all the fast food you eat? If I could swear, I would, but yeah, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could swear, but what's the fast? What's the deal with fast food? You just eat it every day? No, nah, right. Okay, so, <laughs> I'm going to combat myself here. So, so my job as a network engineer, I'm not in an office. So, you know, obviously, my office would be the service stations. And when you're at a service station, you've got all of the fast food available to you, you know, that you could ever want. So, if I'm there, am I going to get a cold sandwich or am I going to get hot food? You know, it's a no-brainer for me. Hot food, you know? Callum yeah. also really likes Red Bull, which is oh, – no. I don't care for that. <laughs> don't say that. I'm going to yeah. get slandered. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't believe how much you drink it. But, I mean, also I'm almost 40, so different different places in life. Um, well, Callum, we're, we're sort of nearing the end here, and I guess that I could just add um, – how lucky I feel to have met you and um, also how incredibly grateful I am that you give two shits about my day or my trading, or if I'm lying to myself or breaking my rules. And despite how much I want to do all my bad habits, I do really appreciate you holding me accountable and making me uh, better and it is, I have said ad nauseum, that trading is a very, very lonely thing. And you certainly make me feel like I have a friend and someone who cares about me. And I know that I'm I'm not the only person you do that for, but I'm certainly incredibly grateful. And can't I can't wait to stand by and watch your career. I know it'll be incredible. And I'm just so proud of you. Thank you. That that does mean a lot. And you you know, I've always got your Blaine. I've always got your back. And just like everyone else, you know, I, I've always got anyone that wants to come to me, especially you, Blaine. I've got a lot of time for you. And Justin, if you ever came on Discord. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, I'm going to ignore that. When you uh, open up your own hedge fund and become a hedgie, can we work for you? <laughs> we have to do salary negotiation. <laughs> All right. Well, bring your big boy pants. <laughs> Are you you're good at salary negotiations, Justin? I've I've, I've had a couple. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Callum, thank you so much for joining us. Is oh oh, is there anything you know at the end of Brad and Walrus's episode? They said some nice stuff about you. Do you want to do you want to say anything? <laughs> say anything about them? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, and I did. I did want to, and I was actually gonna say, you know, I, I did touch on it earlier, but you know, massive thank you to Brad and Stephen. You know, like I say, it, if if I didn't fall into the lap of MTA, you know, I don't know where I'd be now um, without making that sound dramatic. But you know, in, in the trading world, I am so grateful that you guys caught me and that 
you're there for me and I appreciate all the support and I'll make you proud. So thank you so much for all your support and uh, I'm excited to come make some gains in the winter with you boys. <laughs> Do you guys think we made anyone cry during this episode? <laughs> mm, maybe Stephen. Stephen Baker. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Stephen. Gosh, I hope so. Definitely the most emotional Penny Lane pod we've done. Um, Calm, thank you. And it was really an honor to have you on the podcast. And this is your second time, as you know. And uh, I hope I hope you'll come back for a third time. Well, thank you very much to uh, you, Blaine and Justin, for having me. It's an honor to come on here again. Thank you. Of course. Thanks, Callum. All right. Well, we love you, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. See ya. Bye. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Thank you to Joel Edwards, our producer, and Chesley Lowe for the banjo music. We'll see you next time.